So uh, thank you very much. Um, Katarina, you are, where is she, where did she go? There she, you're hiding. Your contributions to our effort were incredible, and I'm so glad you're continuing to do it with your book and the impact that you've had. And it takes courage and the perseverance that I know you have to change the system, as I heard from the, the earlier comments. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about, um, for a few minutes, about the general issues about AI, technology competition. Um, I know quite a few people in the room, and we've worked together to solve this. We've made some progress, but we have a lot of progress to make. And it's for the reasons that the previous questioners were asking. The system is organized around a 1980s peacetime model, and I wish that that were going to be true for the next 50 to 100 years. But something tells me that that's not going to be the way. We're going to have to change our system to address some of these challenges. Um, so let me start with, with the most obvious thing. What's happening with technology that matters? And I want to give you snippets of both uh, synthetic biology as well as AI to give you a sense of what is happening in the world that Silicon Valley represents. Much of it is occurring here in Redwood City. Um, and you know, like this hotel used to be the Sofitel. This is where we had all of our conferences. So it's really here, right? Having been here for 40 years, trust me, I know. Um, one way to understand AI is that there was an early period of an AI winter and then a period of time when the um, machine learning and deep learning were invented. The entire revolution was kicked off in 2011 in a project that was done inside of Google where basically deep learning was used to categorize arbitrary videos by various forms of image training. And a group had, uh, led by a woman named Fei-Fei Li in Stanford created something called ImageNet. And the competition in 2011, 2012, 2013 led to the remarkable ability for computers to identify objects better than humans. Um, so the first wave was really, can computers see better than humans? And the answer is they can. That then led to self-driving and all of the other things that you all have heard about, which are in their way. Now you say, why did I not arrive here in a self-driving car? If you look at the history of technology, I'll give you an example. The deep learning algorithms were invented by mathematicians in the mid-1980s. Right? So that's how long it takes for these key inventions in physics and in math to become commonplace. Obviously, you want to accelerate that, but in my world, that's considered pretty fast. The next phase was what I will describe as the let's implement it as, as re recommendation engines. And you'll see that when you do things like recommendations for movies on Android or on Amazon, what products to buy and so forth and so on. YouTube does something similar. That revolution was pretty interesting. And further, it was then taken over by Facebook and Twitter and others to amp up social media. And as an aside, one of the reasons that everyone is so upset in America is because the this, this systems are amplifying it. And they're amplifying it based on engagement. So what happens with social media companies, they maximize revenue to maximize engagement. To maximize engagement, you maximize outrage, which is why both sides went to the left and to the right. right? But it's easy to understand that it's algorithmically de derived, because that's how they want to maximize revenue. So with that as a sort of a sad comment, and the data is well established, read the Facebook files from the leaker out of Facebook and so forth, this is what really happened. The next thing that happened was a set of people figured out a way built, to build things called large language models. And these large language models are very, very interesting to a computer scientist. Because a large language model studies all of the information that's available, puts it into a network model, and then you figure out what does the network know. So in the book that I wrote with Henry Kissinger last year, we included a quote where we asked the system, which is called GPT-3, um, do you think and, and do you reason? And its answer was, no. You think because you're a human being. I am a large language model, and I follow algorithmic rules. You sit there and you go, like, how did it come up with that? It feels, feels kind of intelligent, kind of not. Now, these large language models are so powerful that the world around us here in the valley is now creating startups that have valuations of a billion dollars with 10 people, with 100 to 500 million of capitalization, with no product, no revenue, and no target. 
Now, this may be, if you're not from California, you may just view this as just insane, crazy people in California, which is perfectly true and often true, in fact. Um, but it tells you that there is a collective judgment that something new has been invented. So let me speculate what does the next, and I'm going to relate this to national security in a minute, but let me just speculate in the next five years the following. It will be true that any form of text, speech, video, and picture multimodally can be both analyzed and generated. Okay, that's pretty powerful. And the second thing is that you'll be able to talk to the computer in a conversational style and it will know who you are and so forth. So I'll give you an example. Within five years, there'll be startups here, and I hope to fund some of them. We'll see if it actually happens, which will do the following. You'll basically, it'll start by personalizing it against yourself. You'll choose this, obviously. You'd opt in. It'll listen to your voice. It'll mimic your voice. It'll sound like you, and it'll begin to behave like you. It can generate arbitrary images of anything, and it will be with you and learn from your behavior. The pitch from this company five years from now will be eternal life. This is your second self. Because when you die, which it, unfortunately every one of us will eventually, it can continue and continue to learn and expand and so forth based on your personality. Now you sit there and you go, this guy is like smoking. Uh, well, not today. It's California. And second, um, this I think is the, t the technology will allow it. Now do you think people will buy this product? You betcha. And they'll, they'll buy it for many reasons, and assistance, and so forth. So now let's think about this from the standpoint of how this affects society. It obviously has huge impacts for social media, and the press, and so forth and so on, and how society works. It has huge implications for education. How do we develop our children? What happens when your child's best friend at 12 is a computer, not a human? I mean, the parents I know are already worried that little Johnny is not outside playing ball, they're playing video games. Well, now imagine they're playing video games with their other personality, and the other personality is smarter than the humans. And furthermore, what happens when that, that human has this impact that they do on, on young minds, right? Won't affect us too much, but we have no experience. In the same sense that we have no experience having global platforms that have the kind of impact that my industry represents. These are new for society. Now, why does this matter for, uh, let, let me do one more example, with, which is synthetic biology, and then I'll talk about China. Synthetic biology, they're trying to rename it um, made with biology, is a relatively simple idea. Everything you see here can be grown in a vat instead of manufactured in a plant. The most obvious examples are food, um, drugs, uh, fuel, but it's also true of plastics, plastic substitutes, rugs, rug substitutes, concrete, concrete substitutes, and so forth. Now today that technology in most cases is more expensive than the fully developed manufacturing, but there are reasons to think that synthetic biology will be a four to thirty trillion dollar industry that America needs to live in, to lead in, excuse me. And there are many reasons for this, including flexibility, disease resistance, uh, carbon resistance, they don't use as much carbon, and things like this. So in the same sense that there's this tech scenario that you all are part of here, we also have this biology one. And the headquarters for that are the East Coast and the usual suspects in Cambridge, Cambridge uh, and Boston, and in this area, South San Francisco. And you go, why am I talking about this? Because in order to build these things, you have to build large plants. These large plants look like breweries because you grow the stuff, and the breweries are near where the feedstocks are. Where are the feedstocks? In the rural states of America. So finally, my industry, which has produced all of this uh, creative stuff, but also inequality and, uh, and all these other issues, may be producing something which brings us together. Because we all have an interest in a made in America, and making things and leading in America and leading global, global things. Now, why do I mention these two? These are global platforms. I want the US to lead global platforms for the world, and I don't want China to do it. You sit there, why does Eric care so much about this? Think about Huawei or TikTok. TikTok is the number one app in America today. Uh, they know where your teenager is. You probably don't, but think about it. Is it okay if a Chinese company knows where your teenager is? At the moment, it seems to be okay. 
Is it okay in the future? Well, that's worthy of debate. Huawei is much more insidious because the Huawei system is so full of holes that we know it was built for surveillance, which is why the government was correct in making it very difficult for Huawei to be successful. So what am I concerned about? I'm concerned about the fact that these Chinese platforms, if they're better than the US, they can become global standards with Chinese values. I'm gonna talk about semiconductors in a minute to highlight this point. So you sit there and you go, how are the Chinese doing in the technologies that Eric just described? China just released a large language model, which they claimed was 10 times larger than the largest one built in the West, which is the, at the moment is the Google one, although there's competition. Um, we looked at it very carefully. We decided that they were lying, but this wouldn't be the first time. Uh, but nevertheless, we know that they have large teams going right after this large language model thing. Why? Because large language models are the beginning of intelligence. And if you want to, we'll take a break of the normal reasoning and let's do a little bit of theoretical thinking. Let's imagine that in 20 years or 30 years, something like that, there are systems that are so smart they are generally intelligent. They're not specifically targeted, but rather generally intelligent. How important are they? Well, let's say China had one and we didn't. It's pretty important that, that we would have to have an answer because if it were generally intelligent and it were powered with the kind of computers that we can imagine in the future, it might be generally intelligent much more than, than humans. So all of a sudden, you've got a new competitive threat. You've got a competitive threat in terms of inventing things, inventing bad things, good things, and so forth. Uh, in the book that I wrote with Kissinger, we actually say that these things, when they are built, will be like, be like nuclear power plants. They'll have guards around them, or like plutonium, where there, there are guards protecting them, because they're that significantly important. Why is it important that America lead? Because I want us to get there first. Now, a couple of people, and I've said this, have said, well, why is there a race? Well, I said, because, because this is a naturally competitive world, and these guys are of enormous power enormous power for, in, for economics and for national security and for growth and for reach and for power, soft power, hard power, and so forth. So if you look, we've got to have a strategy to win. Now in the AI commission that uh, Katerina and I, Brandon and a few others worked on, um, we actually give you the list of the things that we have to, to lead against in China. By the way, they are AI, quantum, software platforms, synthetic biology, which is very large. They have a huge bio program in China, um, and energy and a couple of others. We're already losing in surveillance, which is okay, uh, financial services, which is not. People believe we're gonna start to lose on electronic, uh, electric vehicles and uh, uh, self-driving cars and things like that. That's not a good outcome. Now, semiconductors are also very important because uh, we decided in the 90s as a country to let that one go. And in our report, we state incredibly clearly that we need to stay at least two generations ahead of the Chinese semiconductors. And the largest Chinese semiconductor company is called SMIC. And SMIC has spent, we calculated, about a trillion dollars to try to catch up. And they're still at the 60 nanometer speeds. For, for those of you who are not familiar with semiconductors, nanometers is the sp speed between essentially the, the aspects of the transistors. Um, s lower is better. And there's a real threshold below 10 nanometers. Why is this important? There are only two volume fabs below 10 nanometers. One is at Samsung in South Korea, and another one is at TSMC in Taiwan. Um, notice how close they are to China. So there's a great concern among people who've thought about this that we have critical dependencies on the most advanced chips 100 miles from mainland China. And it, there are all sorts of debates about how to address that. We took a position in the, in the report, and I'll, say, and I'll say very clearly here that USICA, which is the former CHIPS Act, is crucial that we pass it. It's, um, as usual, the Congress is having trouble deciding to do anything about it. They've had it for more than a year and a half, and everyone has been supported, but they haven't been able to get it across the finish line. And it includes $53 billion to buttress, if you will, uh, US semiconductors. And I thought we were great, right? We were done, I was really happy. Um, we'll pass this thing, we're gonna get there. What's the problem with what I just said? 
TSMC announced that in the next two years, they're going to implement $200 billion of new fabs to stay ahead. They've announced that they're going to begin production of the three and three and a half nanometer uh, technologies by the end of this calendar year, which means that they will be available in general terms for us within a year. They've also indicated that two years later, they'll be down at the two nanometer level. It's useful to know that one nanometer is about the threshold between where quantum, uh, quantum effects cause atoms to tunnel next to each other. So they're very, very close to the, to the edge of this. Now, so what do we do? Well, in our recommendations, we say many things, but the most important thing to say is that semiconductors are crucial. Uh, we have to do things that cause us to at least have a backup plan if Taiwan and uh, South Korea become unavailable to us for whatever reason. Um, China will eventually get there. Uh, Trump and uh, a number of very, very smart people figured out that if you restricted their access to a technology called ASML, which is the, the sort of the photolithography machines that are important, that would help, and that was a good decision by President Trump. These ASML machines, uh, they cost about $100 million each, and they are backlogged for the next two years. That's an example of how significant. That's why we have this semiconductor issue. So the long and short of it is that what I, and I, I don't want to overrun my, my time, but let me just sort of answer with a couple of things. This conference is really about technology and AI and innovation. At the forefront of the world that we're talking about, quantum, there, uh, I'm involved with a startup which is doing quantum secure communications. I can talk if, you're, if people are interested in it about uh, quantum computing and so forth and so on. At the forefront of the things we need to do are AI leadership. The most exciting aspect of AI right now are these large language models. People don't know exactly where it's going to go, but people are putting billions of dollars of capital to make that happen. That is a great thing. Thank you to the capital markets for coming, funding my friends who have crazy ideas. At least one of those is going to be a trillion dollar corporation, in my opinion. Um, and then the final comment I was going to make has to do with China and leadership. The more you think about China, the more you realize, and I got into this five years ago when I was working for the Defense Department. The Defense Department likes to refer to China as a near peer. The Defense Department needs to refer to them as a peer competitor. By any analysis, China has arrived. We collectively, you, me, this community, the people in the Bay Area, have underestimated what an autocracy with a lot of money and a lot of really smart people in a command and control situation can do. We underestimated them. I underestimated how clever and smart they could be. And we need to take it very seriously. We need to get ourselves organized. There are many things that we can do to improve it, but my message to you is uh, if we don't, in 10 or 15 years from now, we're gonna be in a situation where new forms of warfare, new forms of dynamics, are causing us to have real strategic issues. I'm not worried in the next year because at the moment everyone's obsessed with Ukraine, which is sort of a tragedy, obviously. But the real competition is going to be the situation where we are both uh, codependent of China in the sense that everything we buy has a Chinese component, but we're also in a rivalry with them. It's called a rivalry partnership. And that is a very, very tough thing if you're a political leader to live through. So thank you very much, Sam.